All right. Thank you so much for joining us online, here in person as well. It's snowing outside. No school tomorrow, maybe. I don't know. Right? Ha, ha, ha. That's, that's the way it goes, right? To already offer a holiday, and then it snows. Um, we're going to be dealing today, as I believe Travis mentioned uh, to you earlier in the service, with a really serious topic, one that I'm super passionate about and have been strangely excited to preach about, and that is depression. A depression touches every one of us in some way. Uh, and we're going to see that in just a moment as I'm going to just kind of rattle through some statistics to kind of start things out. So I want you to see how big of a deal this is, how big of an impact depression has on our world. But as I'm saying these things, there's one slide I just want to keep on the screen and show you guys online as well. Um, this is the probably, to me, the most well-known hotline number. It's a number that you can call, 1-800-273-TALK. If you've ever had thoughts of suicide or thoughts about death, call this number. There are people trained to answer that call, to talk with you, to walk with you through that. Um, so um, we're going to leave this on for a while. And I encourage you, feel free to take, if you've never seen this before, take a picture of it with your phone if you want. Screenshot it if you're watching at home. Uh, th this is an important number to remember. There's also a short code 741741. Uh, that's put out by the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. So you can literally text and begin a conversation with trained people there as well. Um, and then also for just prayer support, uh, we'll talk about this again later in the service. You can text the word SAD to our church number, 859-356-3162. Like I said, at some point in all of our lives, we're going to be touched by depression. And I want to read to you some statistics that come from the DBSA website. Um, and I've checked it with other websites, uh, psychological websites, uh, and, and it's corroborated. It, this, there's no disputing how big of a deal this is. Major depressive disorder affects approximately 17.3 million people in the United States. That's adults 18 years and older. And that's 7.1% of our population. That's huge. So this is a big deal. And depression, some people don't realize, often accompanies other medical conditions. One in four cancer patients experience depression. And I don't know about you, but my prayer list has ebbed and flowed for years with friends and acquaintances that have dealt with cancer. And to know that 25% of them are going to have depression, that's a big deal. Here's an interesting one. One in three heart attack survivors will experience depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. This comes from the World Health Organization back in 2017. Depression is the cause of over two-thirds of the 30,000 reported suicides in the United States each year. For every two homicides committed in the U.S., there are three suicides. Up to, this is kind of good news. Up to 80% of those treated for depression show an improvement in their symptoms generally within four to six weeks of beginning treatment. 80% shows improvement. But despite its high treatment success rate, nearly two out of three people suffering with depression do not actively seek or receive proper treatment. Two out of three. So in my, in my book, one of the biggest things we can do to really deal with this and start making headway against depression is to actually start taking away the stigma and actually doing something about it and encouraging all of us in this room to know, okay, this is a real thing. Uh, let's not ignore it. Let's not bury it. Let's not be ashamed of it. Let's deal with it together. I want to give you a little sentence from the DBSA website that defines depression. I think it's really crucial to know what we're actually talking about. Depression is a serious but treatable medical condition that affects how a person feels, thinks, and acts. Though typically characterized by feelings of sadness, depression symptoms may appear as irritability or apathy. 
Tasks that seem to be easy before may take longer because of lack of concentration. Sometimes other illnesses or medications can cause or mimic symptoms of depression. So it's important to have a complete physical examination. And all of that leads me to say this to you today. Depression is a long-standing pandemic. We need to treat it like the health issue that it is. I don't know about you, but I have not used the word pandemic probably hardly ever, if ever, in my life till last year. And I've used it a bazillion times since then. But to know that depression has been around so much longer and it's so global and affects so many people. Worldwide, number one cause of disability is depression. I really want us to sort of rip away the stigma that it's just something broken within me. I don't know what it is, and I'm going to kind of keep it to myself and not tell other people. We need to start treating it like the health issue that it is. We don't leave physically open wounds untreated. Let's treat our open mental wounds as well. Because even those often point to, in many cases, physical issues. I've always felt like it was hypocritical for us to be okay with the lifelong diabetic, but not the lifelong depressed. Why would we treat one differently than the other? One must take insulin, perhaps, for entire life and, radically, uh, and regularly seek medical attention and speak to a physician. Why would we be treated to depressed persons different? Well, that, that, that's not sh something you should be doing. Why not? Once you come to understand there, there's a lot more going on that could be causing this, and it could actually be so physical. I had a conversation this is past week of different brain injuries that happen in a person that can cause depression simply by serving in the military, simply by being a first responder, simply by playing football. If you're depressed, you should talk to someone about it. Talk to a physician. Get an examination. It could be that it can be medically treated so easily, so simply. So don't, that's something I didn't hear in church <laughs> growing up, right? We need to say these things because they're real, because they're true. Having said that, yes, it is also something that can be dealt with spiritually. Absolutely. And that's vitally important. It may even be the most important thing. I would argue it is even if we were talking about diabetes, even if we were talking about cancer, even if we were talking about anything else, the spiritual aspect of anything is most vitally important because it can help you overcome anything, help you deal with anything. In fact, before I jump into God's Word, in a moment we're going to look at just the first three verses of a song written in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, Psalm 40, just the three, first three verses. But before I do that, let me go back to a secular psychological resource, Psychology Today. Back in April of 2019, they posted an article about this study that was done. And it's very interesting. The study revealed only one in four adults diagnosed with depression who claimed religion was important to them were still depressed 10 years later. Okay? So one in four who said, I value religion, were, only one in four were still depressed. What's interesting is that was a study, that this same study was done, that group of adults did not have a depressive parent. If one or both of your parents have experienced depression, that puts you more at risk, according to our medical community. So they did the same study with adults who had at least one depressive parent, and it turns out the statistics were even better. That one in 10 adults, 10 years later, were not depressed anymore. One in 10 that said they valued religion, okay? So there is something about our faith journey that helps. <laughs> we know this, but where we struggle is that when it seems to not be helping, we wonder what's wrong with us, and we wonder where God is, and we wonder what, what do we do with that. That's where Psalm 40 comes in, and I love it. Let me read to you the first three verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, 
out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you seven things in those three verses that help us to deal with depression. I'm going to rattle through them fairly quickly. The first one, depression is like being stuck in a muddy pit. And it's a good work picture for us to remember. That, may not, that doesn't sound like the most inspirational part of that passage, does it? But what I love about it saying that is for those who've experienced depression, you see that and you're like, that's a good way to describe it right there. You're stuck. Uh, if you see, I, I've never been in uh, quicksand before, but I've watched a lot of TV. And whenever someone's in quicksand on TV, what is the worst thing to do? Yeah, move. <laughs> start panic. Start wiggling a little bit. You're like, oh, I'm going to get out of here. And, uh, you always hear the hero who apparently knows a lot about quicksand say, don't move. We will throw a rope to you and tie it to my horse or my Ford F-150 and pull you out. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. Depression reminds us, and this word picture in Psalm 40 reminds us, we can't get out on our own. That's probably the most important truth we can put our wrap around our brains, especially for, for some reason, I believe we men who experience depression, we don't get this first point. We're in a miry pit. We're stuck, and we need something outside of ourselves to help pull us out. Okay? Number two, incredible patience is required to overcome depression. I put overcome in quotes. Maybe deal with would be better. It requires patience. In the psalm, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. The psalmist knew that it required patience. You know, there are instances where I've known of people that have been battling depression where they've seemingly experienced complete immediate healing from that. And it's in the rearview mirror. It's not something they deal with very much anymore. That's a beautiful thing. But for others, it's a journey that's longer than that. And still for others, it's a lifelong journey. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul, who dare I say was probably a pretty holy man, who had a great walk with the Lord. God used him to write 13 of the 27 New Testament books. Pretty, pretty strong spiritual guy, right? In 2 Corinthians 12, he said that he had a thorn in his flesh. And the Bible never reveals what that was. A lot of scholars think it probably was some kind of physical ailment that he was experiencing, but we just don't know. Paul said, I asked the Lord to take it from me three times. And each time, God decided to not take it from him. So Paul quit writing letters, quit praying. No, he just kept following the Lord with this thorn in the flesh. I believe for some people, this could be the reality of depression, a lifelong journey, the thorn in the flesh that doesn't put you apart from God. On the contrary, it drives you even closer to him. Number three, God hears you. In the psalm, the psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry. He never said, I'm in this merry pit. God must not be hearing my prayers. Although we've said that many times, and that's normal to feel that way, and it's even normal to express that. But Psalm 40 reminds us that just because you're not getting the results you're wishing for doesn't mean he doesn't hear you. You must believe this is a crisis of faith when you're dealing with anything difficult and especially depression. What the enemy would want you to believe is since you are still depressed, since you've not had an immediate result, then God must not be there. And he must not be hearing you. And therefore, you can give up on that. That's what the enemy would want you to believe. But friends, I'm here to tell you, the Bible reminds us that many times in life, we're going to be waiting on the Lord. It's what we do. It's what faith is all about. They wouldn't call it faith otherwise, right? If I could rub the genie lamp and get what I want anytime I wanted, that don't require much faith at all. We must wait on the Lord and believe that he hears our cry, and he absolutely does. Number four, 
a key to dealing with depression is a firm foundation. I like how the psalmist says it. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, that firm foundation. We need that. It's a key to dealing with depression. There is bedrock truths that can keep us stable when we feel like we're being pushed and shoved by the winds of our feelings and emotions and circumstances. And I could probably give you a lot of truths from Scripture that formulate that bedrock foundation, but I want to just give you one that I hope will be very easy for all of us to remember. You've heard the acrostic MVP, correct? MVP, most valuable player in sports, MVP. I want you to remember this for your firm foundation. God made me. I have great value to God. The life God has given me has purpose. Made, value, purpose, MVP. These things are true of you no matter what. You know what's amazing about those truths? You could be watching or listening right now. You could be in this room right now, and you might be completely and utterly atheist. You don't even believe there is a God. And yet, these things are still true about you no matter what. Because truth is not dependent upon whether or not we believe it to be true or not. It is still true. You can walk out here and say, gravity, I'm not thinking it's real. That's okay. You're not floating to the ceiling. Gravity exists. Even if you don't believe there is a God, even if you're trying to figure out what you really believe when it comes to spiritual things right now, I want to tell you right now, you were made by God. He values you. And he has a purpose for your life. And if you begin to believe in him, you will get to experience that amazing purpose in your life. All right, number five, a key to dealing with depression is having established goings. That's a direct quote from the King James Version of this passage I read. I love this. He set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. I'm going to start calling everything on my calendar, my goings, just to mess with people. Well, let me check out my goings today. It is what? I love that. That's what God wants to do. He wants to establish your goings. He wants to open up doors for you to move in a, in a direction that's going to help you get set outside of your own head and into the hearts of others and into the heart of God. This is the key to dealing with depression. When God establishes our goings, he has us go towards connecting with others in relationship, gathering like we are in worship today, probably gathering in smaller groups. He wants us to not do life alone. He's going to lead you into interactions and relational opportunities that will help you get outside of yourself. But not only that, one of the best therapies for depression is to serve others. God will establish your goings and he will always lead you forward into the very mission of Jesus Christ himself, who said, I came not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. One of the best ways for us to deal with depression and anxiety and all those things that want to put us in the miry pit is to actually go and give away our lives to others. We need to look for opportunities. We need to pray for opportunities to do that. And then we need to push through the doubt in the fear of doing that, and do it. And watch how it impacts you. Number six. If you are depressed, try finding your song to God. Try finding your song to God. Going back to Psalm 40, it says in verse 3, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. To be honest with you, I almost left this one out because it felt kind of weird, almost cheesy. But it's so true. Music is so powerful. And you know what? I was thinking about this today, how powerful music is. This is going to sound silly, but I can remember the songs I listened to during my breakup time with Sherry, who's my wife now. I can remember, I can't remember what I wore yesterday, but I can remember Billy Joel's Uptown Girl. I don't know why that song got me through that breakup. I don't know why. It was upbeat. It was cool. 
But I can remember that song so well, and I remember listening to it, and I remember it helping me. There are songs that have such powerful language. In fact, I believe music is created by God to express things that are deep within our soul that we can normally not express at all. And that's why when you're going through depression and anxiety and you're dealing with something, you need to watch what you're bringing in, media, musically. Because I would, I would ask, is what you're bringing in speaking truth about what's real? Or is it actually throwing kerosene on the fires of your depression, making it worse? So that's one part of the equation. But I think also, like, find your song to God. These worship songs that we sing, man, we got, we're so blessed Man, down where I grew up in Harlan County, we had AM radio, barely. <laughs> One or two stations. You know, I can go to 93.3, 104.3, 90.1 at any given moment in this area and hear a song about God or to God. And as you listen, and I've heard so many people say this, like, oh my goodness, the Lord spoke to me. That song put into words what I'm feeling. And I needed to hear that. That song put into words what God has been trying to tell me, and I needed to hear that. There's something powerful about music. You know, interestingly enough, David wrote, wrote most of the Psalms. Apparently, he was a great lyre player, harpist, if you will. And, you know, if you knew this or not, I'm pretty sure Saul, the first king of Israel, might have been bipolar. Saul actually hired David away from tending sheep for his dad to come be in the palace just to play music to calm Saul's spirit. It's biblical, friends. God wants to put a new song in your mouth and in your heart. And he will in time as you wait on him and as you cry unto him. All right, one last one, number seven. God wants to use your depression to point others to him. I have never heard anybody say that before. It's probably been said, and I've missed it. I hope it has been. If you've never heard that before, I want you to let that soak in for a moment. It also, it kind of reveals the stigma we've put on depression. If Almost, we didn't mean to. I don't think we meant to, but we did. We talk about how, you know what, that physical thing you're going through, that, that cancer diagnosis, that journey of rehab to get that that torn ACL, reconstruct him, and God's going to use that for his glory, blah, blah, blah. But we don't say that enough about this, but it's so true. I think of my own dad's story, and one of the biggest things that God used to bring my dad to faith in Jesus was him watching his mom, my mama, battle cancer, horrifically. Throat cancer, part of her tongue removed, part of her throat and larynx removed. Had to learn how to talk, swallow, eat again. It was very difficult. Trips to Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And we prayed and prayed. Many thousands of people prayed for my mama. If anybody was going to be healed miraculously immediately, it would be that saintly woman down there in Harlan County. And it didn't happen that way. It was a journey, a long journey. And eventually she was cancer free. But it was a long journey. But God used that journey. My dad, I remember him telling me, like, I watched mom still believe even as her body went through that. And that made a difference. <laughs> the world needs to see people who have depression who still believe. But for some reason, we've inadvertently trained people who are depressed that something must be wrong and God must not be with you or you must not be getting something right. You got your wires crossed with God because if your wires were not crossed with God, you would never feel depressed. That's a lie that the enemy has used even Christ followers to perpetuate out into the world. Friends, I got good news for you. We're all going to experience difficulties in this world till kingdom come. One of those Difficulties is depression, and some people will battle it their entire lives. But the good news is this. God is still with them. God still hears our prayers no matter what we're going through, no matter who you are. There's hope. He's here. He's with you. And he will journey with you through that thorn in the flesh. And yeah, maybe in a day, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, there'll be no depression. You'll be like, yay, or maybe it'll come back and then it'll go away and then it'll come back. Or maybe it's a lifelong issue. Whichever one of those it might be, 
God is still God. You were still made by him. He still values you, and he has a purpose for your life. None of that changes. And that's the gospel in God's word today. I invite you to cling to it, to believe it, to not only believe it for yourself, but if you're like, I can't even relate to depression. I've, I've been joyful my whole life, and I know people like that. Praise God that they're in the world. That's wonderful. But listen, you need to know this too, that though this might not be your battle, it is a battle that God can use for his glory in other people's lives. So let's rip away the stigma and just let's own all of this and know that this is what's true and this is what's real. And let's come before God together and say, okay, God, we have a lot of depression in our country and in our world. Help us to help everyone around us to know that they're made by you, that are valued by you. You have a purpose for their life and you hear their cries no matter what. Let me give you a couple of next steps. First, Determine to keep crying out to God, knowing he hears you. If you're depressed and dealing with depression right now, this is like to me, if you're like, I am not feeling like my feet are anywhere near solid rock. There is zero songs in my heart and mouth. And I am in the pit. And if I wiggle, I sink even deeper. If that's where you are, you can still do this step. Cry out to God. And believe he hears you. That's the first baby step to getting your feet back on solid rock. But secondly, hold someone's rope. This comes from a story. Actually, it's a historical account. This isn't just some story. This happened. Paralyzed man spent a lot of his days laying on a mat, probably on a street where people would put money. He had some friends. We all need friends, right? He had some friends who said, you know, Jesus, I heard, can do anything. So they picked up the mat, figured out where Jesus was, and they went to that house where Jesus was teaching to bring their friend to him. But they couldn't get to Jesus. There was too big of a crowd. Couldn't, couldn't work their way through. So they got innovative. They got determined. And they climbed up on the roof of that house, tore a hole out of the roof, and lowered that mat with their friend on it with ropes so that that mat came down. I, I would love to be, if I could time travel and see a few things, this would, I would say this would be in my top five list, to watch a hole come into the roof, and everybody's like, what's happening? <laughs> and this man on a mat comes down in front of Jesus, and the man was healed of his paralysis. That's what we do, guys. Till Jesus comes back or till we breathe our last breath, we hold the rope for others. You don't have to know what to say. Sometimes it's best to be quiet. Just be there. Just be a friend. Just show up. That's it. it takes time. But that's holding the rope for others. And that's how God could use you to help someone find their song to God. That's how someone could use you to give them hope that God still hears them. You being his hands and his feet in a very dark world. I want to put back on the screen the slide that had the hotline number on it. Because again, this is huge. If you or anyone you know has been having thoughts of suicide, take it seriously. Treat it as if you just found this, you woke up one morning and there is a big tumor on the side of your head. No amount of hairspray is going to cover it up. You're going to call your doctor, right? You need to treat that thought of suicide the same way. Deal with it immediately. Treat it. It's urgent, okay? And help others do the same. Did you also notice uh, on the screen here, uh, once again, that we have a way that you could text the church number, 859-356-3162. This may sound weird, but I'm going to have every single one of you get your phone out and hold it right now. You may not text a thing. You may not dial a thing right here in this room, or if you're at home, if you're able to do this. You may not text a thing, but get it out and hold it. I want you to know that just by what you can do with this little rectangle, it can make a huge difference in your own life and in someone else's life. You're always on this thing, doing stuff on this thing, right? 
Today, if you're experiencing depression, whether it be minor or major, no matter what it is, you can literally just let our pastoral staff know, and we'll be praying for you, by texting the word SAD to our church number, okay? I promise you, we won't be invasive. We'll throw a little word of encouragement, let you know we're praying for you. We may send you a link for a reading plan on the Bible app that might help. And at any point, you don't want to get that anymore. All you got to do is text the word stop, and we, we don't talk to you about that anymore at all. It's not invasive. But it's a way to let someone else know, I'm in a pit. I can't get out. Will you pray for me? And then today, if you've heard all of this, and maybe you've been thinking about Christianity, you've been thinking about this Jesus stuff, and you've never taken a step of faith yet, but today you're, you're realizing, based on what you've heard today, I believe this. And I want to walk with the Lord from now on. I want to be a child of God from now on. If that's you, you text the word faith to our church number so we can know that. We can pray for you. We can encourage you and walk you through next steps as you begin your new spiritual journey. All right? I'm going to invite every one of you to stand. We're going to stand together and have a closing word of prayer. And uh, we'll be dismissed after we pray. But as I pray right now, if you are experiencing sadness. As I talk out loud to God, you cry out to him right here, right now. Let's pray. Father, you've reminded us that when there seems to be no way, you make a way. That, Father, you have the power to pull us up out of the miry pit and put our feet on solid rock and to put a new song in our heart and in our mouths. Father, in this moment right here, right now, I pray, Father, that you would help every one of us to know that you hear this prayer. You hear all of our prayers right now. And you will never leave us. That even if we have not put our faith in you, you hear our cries to you right now. Father, I lift up to you those all over the world who are experiencing depression. Use us to hold the rope for them. Give us the courage, the compassion to just show up, to be your hands and feet. Help this world know there's hope in you, God. That they were made by you, that you love them, you value them, and you have a purpose for their lives, God. Lord, for those who might be watching, listening today, those in this room that are experiencing depression, and maybe they've been battling it a long time, help them to know that you are not going to waste that pain that you're going to use it for your glory and to help someone else. Father, we cry out to you now. Thank you that by faith in you, we can now know that no matter what comes our way, no matter what our circumstances are, Father, that we are yours. You've got us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen.